Okay, welcome uh, next to the panel on green finance. Um, I see one of the uh, panelists is also here, so please, uh, the other panelists, uh, welcome to join already uh, in the in the chairs. But I'll I'll introduce you then one by one uh, before your opening statement. But uh, let me first say so. Um, I'm Esaljo Kivole, head of research in the research unit of the Bank of Finland, and uh, will be chairing. So green finance is potentially a hugely important new area of finance for both practitioners and researchers alike. Ability to use financial instruments and contracts to facilitate transition towards net zero world could be one of the keys to the, um, solving the climate change problem or challenge. We have three excellent researchers in the panel on this topic. Uh, who will offer their insights from the vantage point of cutting-edge research. Uh, while the general goals of green finance are indeed laudable, a closer look makes it obvious that, as is often the case, uh, devil can be in the details. So it matters a great deal how financial instruments are designed and what kind of supporting institutional arrangements are available. So this is why also uh, research on the topic is so important. So uh, let me now turn to the, uh, uh, to the panelists. So uh, I thought that each of, and probably you have been advised already before that, uh, each of you would have five minutes, maybe 10 minutes uh, for your opening statements. And then we will discuss including uh, questions from the audience. So as the first speaker, um, let me introduce Amir uh, Lebdui uh, from the School of Oriental and African Studies, London. So prior to joining uh, SOAS, Amir uh, has worked as a fellow at the London School of Economics and led the Canning House Research Forum on the Future of Trade in uh, Latin America. He was also an affiliated lecturer in development studies at the University of Cambridge, where he also did his PhD. And if I've got, forgot something important from your bio, please feel free to uh, add and, and correct uh, yourself. But uh, welcome, Amir, and uh, the floor is yours. Would you like to come here or maybe, well, you have the mic, so yeah. uh, it's up to you. Please okay. go ahead. Thanks. Well, it's uh, it's an absolute pleasure to to be with uh, such with you and you know such experts today to discuss the important topic of uh, sovereign debt and uh, green finance in developing countries. Uh, the specific uh, thank you. The specific issue that um, I wanted to focus on or address was the context of resource-dependent economies which is particularly important considering that two-thirds of the developing world are resource-dependent countries. And the three main messages that I wanted to share uh, in the 10 minutes that we have allocated, the first one is that resource-dependent countries are particularly vulnerable right, to uh, the risks of climate-induced uh, debt distress. The second one is, even in the context of a low-carbon future, um, these countries are not geared towards benefiting from the so-called green windows of opportunity, right? thereby uh, cushioning or, or improving their, their climate resilience because of the uneven nature of the industrial geography of decarbonization. And the third message was that we need to rethink green finance mechanisms uh, and the standard policy advice, which have, has too often emphasized short-term fiscal stabilization, but at the expense of the financing needed for long-term structural transformation to improve uh, fiscal resilience to climate change. So, similarly to, to Ugo, we both kind of have different maps uh, to support our, our arguments. So here, I just wanted to show you three maps. The first one, showing that you know, the over, overwhelming majority of the developing world is dependent on commodities, right? whether mining, agriculture, or fossil fuels. 
and a few points to stress, and, and that really kind of, uh, I think, uh, echoes nicely the message that we just heard on who's the most exposed. But here we're showing that those countries that are you know, uh, dependent on agriculture as a source of exports, revenues, and jobs are particularly vulnerable because agricult productivity in the agricult agricultural sector uh, is vulnerable to fluctuations in temperature, fluctuation, uh, temperature fluctuations and precipitations in the long term, but also uh, in the short term, and it's already happening to uh, increasingly frequent meteorological events. Right? So just in the past few years, cyclones, hurricanes, droughts, these had massive fiscal effects on countries, including in the Caribbean, in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, uh, where crops were destroyed and, and associated revenues with it. Uh, last year alone, uh, in, it's estimated that climate change uh, generated losses of about $38 billion on the African continent. But even the countries that depend on fossil fuels, right? It's estimated that by the ILO, about 50% of jobs in fossil fuel extraction and fossil fuel-based generation will be lost by 2030. So what does it mean for not only the jobs, but also the, the, you know, kind of the countries that depend on those as a source of fiscal revenues. And on the other side, when thinking, I mean, it's becoming more and more obvious that with global decarbonization comes a range of benefits, right? And very often the benefits outweigh the loss uh, in so-called uh, dirty industries, not only in terms of jobs, right? So investing in renewables create more jobs than investing the same amount in fossil fuels, but also in terms of innovation, the higher spillovers from low-carbon innovation than for conventional technologies. But the problem here is that those benefits are not really happening in the same places where you have a lot of the uh, fiscal distress caused by climate change, right? So we have three, four countries that concentrate about three quarters of uh, job creation around renewables. And that's not even considering the issue of quality of jobs, right? It's just the quantity. But even in countries like Brazil, the problem is that most of the job created around renewables are low-skilled, low-paid, temporary jobs, right, in construction, maintenance. And there's a similar story, not just in jobs, but also in terms of innovation, in terms of trade and manufacturing, right? Three, four countries concentrate the bulk of the benefits on that front. And one thing that I also wanted to show in terms of, kind of even when it comes to, to, to uh, financing for new technologies, including green hydrogen, the structure in which those commercial networks are planned um, generate a high risk of renewing all dependencies, right? And especially the resource dependency that I just mentioned earlier. So in terms of raw minerals, critical materials are needed as inputs for low carbon technologies. But even when it comes to hydrogen, uh, it kind of reproduces this pattern of exporting that source of energy towards industrial hubs. Which leads me to then, you know, the, oops, sorry, to the point on how do we kind of rethink uh, green financing mechanisms in resource dependent countries and particularly fossil fuel dependent countries. The standard policy, of the, the standard policy advice has focused on, you know, fiscal stabilization mechanisms, especially through sovereign wealth funds. But with the work that we're doing with, with Tony, we're finding that these mechanisms very often don't really prepare countries what comes next, right? And don't really address the bigger issues, which is the fact that their productive structures are the reason why they're so vulnerable to climate change and why they're not really able to capture some of the gains of global uh, decarbonization. Um, so in a way, it might be more suitable to also think about alternatives, right? Including uh, national development banking and green national development banking as a way to generate the financing that is needed to, uh, to increase local resilience of jobs, industry, and, uh, and so on. So besides the market-based mechanisms that I think were uh, addressed today, uh, the emphasis there is really thinking about, at the domestic level, but also international level, about how to really rethink productive structures and that link with long-term uh, sovereign debt uh, outcomes. And at the international level, my ma last message, how am I doing with time? Yeah. Fine. This is the, the last message is also thinking about at the moment, most of the international financing uh, or green financing in developing countries tends to focus on 
you know, kind of reproducing that extraction, right, of, of, of raw materials. And it's becoming very obvious, and that's a message that, you know, has been uh, shared clearly by people like Carlos Lopez and, and, and his colleagues at the Africa Climate Foundation, that there is a role for international investors and, and financiers to link those investments and green, green finance with... Sorry, that's my alarm. <laughs> we all wake up in different moods. Um, with an agenda of you know, opening up pathways for green industrialization, and African policymakers would be a lot more interested in these type of investments that are not kind of reproducing those patterns, but also enabling uh, to link you know, the kind of dilemma, the climate agenda, with the local industrial development agenda. So um, I will end on that note and, and look forward to, to the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Amir. Let me just get my... Maybe leave it by you. Yeah. So we could go then uh, straight to the next uh, speaker, who is uh, uh, Anthony Barzogas, a professor, professorial fellow at the uh, United Nations uh, University's uh, Maastricht Economic and Social Research Institute on Innovation and Technology. So Anthony has worked on financial systems, corporate investment, and innovation uh, dynamics. Uh, particularly, he also has obtained real-life exposure to investment decisions and financial markets during his tenure as executive board director at the European Bank for Re Reconstruction and, uh, and Development. So, very happy to have you with us today, Anthony, so please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, what I would like to do today is to talk about green finance and green innovation. And uh, we have been asked to stick to two slides. This is what I'm going to do. Uh, basically, what I would like to do is to start from operational experience and see if we can draw some interesting implications for policy, but also research. So it will be a practical presentation, more from a private sector perspective. Uh, so I will highlight a few points on green finance and a few points on green innovation. Indeed, the relevance between the two. Let me start with green finance. Uh, Basically, I would like to convey a few concrete messages. The first message is that we keep talking about green finance in terms of green bonds. I will urge the audience here, but also the policy community, to look more on, say, low profile below the radar applications. Energy efficiency, trade finance are very important issues related to green finance. We tend to overlook them, and this is a mistake. A mistake for policymakers, but also research. My second point is about green bonds and how it's connected to commercial markets. If we look at what happened in the last 20 years of the expanding use of green bonds, something very interesting emerges, and that is the relevance to commercial market trends. The most important is scale. Green bonds have been facing a threshold of, say, 500 million, and beyond that, Below that, it is very difficult to activate them. Similar issues we can raise of other aspects of commercial markets related to green bonds. Now, let me come to the area of what I have been doing in the last 10 years, which is development finance. Development finance institutions have played a very important role in the diffusion of green finance products. First, in the below the radar applications, as I mentioned before, but also in terms of green bonds. First, when critical stages of the market were in place, they stepped in. But also, I would say, looking forward, the developed financial institutions have been playing a prominent role of stamp of approval. And as the market becomes more critical about impact, the presence of development financial institutions in structuring green bonds becomes even more important. And this is something that we need to keep in mind. Two final points on the green finance dimension. My first point is about international coordination. It is very important to have global banks, but also other global players at the table in a kind of global coordination context, because spillovers can come anytime, and that can undermine and disengage from a green finance mandate and, uh, and process. 
my final point is, I come back to what Kunal was saying at the beginning. If indeed debt markets are moving in the direction that we all know, then we need to prioritize green finance processes, but also policy initiatives, because the market will become more difficult and you know, these guys will pay the price. Now let me turn to the innovation side, green innovation. I think if we are serious about the Paris Agreement, we need to talk and carefully study green innovation patterns. They are not very promising. They keep moving in, say, the end user perspective, but more fundamental innovation is not you know, progressing the way that we would like to see. The point I would like to make is the following. If we think of green innovation in a kind of nexus from green finance to green innovation, I think we are making a mistake because the whole process is about a triangle. It's about risk capital, green finance and green innovation. And we should be looking at this triangle in a kind of holistic view if we want really to produce decent policy recommendations. Is this relevant to developing countries? Is this relevant to emerging countries? I think it is because whatever resources developed countries will invest on R&D, we need to have, say, complementary activity, innovation-related activity in developing countries. And this is a very important dimension. Is there a role for development finance institutions in this process? I think there is. And we need to move from you know, development finance objectives as a scale priority to development finance uh, priorities and policy objectives as a quality priority. By quality, I mean that they can step in and you know, engage and uh, trigger the risk side of the triangle that I was mentioning before. My final point, Chair, is, is about intermediate and bridge technologies. If we did start thinking about green innovation as part of this triangle of green finance, risk capital and green innovation, in the middle we have you know, the need to better understand at the sectoral level what a bridge technology, what an intermediate technology is for a developing country. Take, for example, gas and other applications that you know, African countries have been you know, protesting about. We need to understand what kind of solutions are practically important for these countries, to what extent innovation can play a role in this process, and how we'll finance this process in this entirety. I'll stop here and I'm happy to take you know, further discussion on, this, on these issues in the Q&A. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony. And uh, then uh, we have uh, Shakira Mustafa. Welcome. Uh, you are from the Overseas Development Institute, ODI, London. Uh, Shakira is an economist with expertise across a range of uh, public finance issues, including budget and expenditure management and debt management. Earlier, she has worked with the uh, Ministry of Planning and the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Trinidad and Tobago supporting various public finance reforms and the development of economic diversification strategies. Shakira holds a master's degree in public and economic policy from the LSE. So Shakira, welcome and the floor is yours. Can you guys hear me? Yeah? Cool. Uh, Amir, this is the first time I saw a map and saw Trinidad and Tobago on the map. So thank you very much for that, for that recognition, despite being a dot. Um, I'm so I can't take the credit. But still, yeah. you presented it, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, so good morning, all. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today, making my first debut uh, presentation post-COVID. It's all been Zoom since then, so apologies if I'm a bit rusty. Um, so originally, when I was asked to participate in this panel, I was like, ooh, I'm going to talk about debt for, debt for climate swaps. Then I saw I was following Ugo, and I said, and I thought Ugo is going to say everything interesting already. So what next could I say? And then I saw Amir's presentation, and I was like, oh, there's some brilliant work that we've been doing at ODI on country platforms. Now I'll explain what that is, but it's a new, it's basically an innovative model for providing and delivering climate finance from developed countries to developing countries. Now. 
for those who have heard about it or who haven't, at last year's COP in Glasgow, the Just Energy Transition Partnership uh, from South Africa was the crown jewels. This partnership was, um, which is known as JECP for short, it represented the first step towards creating a country platform for climate action. In these 10 minutes, I'll explain what exactly is the JECP, what is a country platform, how are the two related, and ultimately, why are they important? I draw heavily on an ODI paper written by my colleagues and me called Country Platforms for Climate Action, Something Borrowed, Something New. Of course, 10 minutes is not enough to cover the entire, terry, um, entire paper, and for those who are interested, I strongly recommend reading it. So what exactly is uh, the South African Just Energy Transition Partnership? Well, it's a partnership between the governments of South Africa and a handful of G7 countries, specifically the UK, U US, France, Germany, and the EU, with the latter forming the International Partners Group. This group of international actors have pledged uh, an initial 8.5 billion to support the government of South Africa to decarbonize its energy sector. Apologies, I'm recovering from a flu. It's not COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what is noteworthy about JACP is that it's a mutually beneficial partnership that links domestic po political priorities. Uh, on, on the right-hand side of the slide, in South Africa, their priority is job creation, economic growth. The unemployment rate is one of the highest, about 32% last year. It also, on the other side of the table, is international climate goals, specifically the Paris uh, temperature goals. This JEP intends to link both of them in a very direct and explicit way. For the international community, given that South Africa is one of the world's most carbon-intensive electricity producers, helping the South African government to accelerate the retirement of its coal-fired power plants can, gen can, can be a step in the right direction for reaching these temperature goals. From the point of view of the South African government, this partnership enables them to push through critical reforms to transform the country's electricity sector in order to improve its re reliability and cost effectiveness in a just manner. Currently, as you may be aware, the sector is weighed down by a heavily indebted state-owned um, power company, ESCOM, uh, that re frequently re relies on bailouts from the, from the government. I think last year it was about 1% of GDP, while the net losses of ESCOM are about 0.4% of GDP. So on top of that, electricity tariffs are rising and there are frequent power outages. Because of this, the sector itself is a huge impediment to growth in South Africa. However, while the reforming the electricity sector has been a priority for the government, it's been complicated by the country's long-standing dependence on coal. What this means is that there's a lot of patronage systems and jobs that heavily depend on coal revenues. The partnership therefore represents a window of opportunity for the South African government, providing a potential catalyst to enable key interventions in support of more rapid decarbonization. The idea being that how uh, a lot of international public finance uh, will be helped to compensate and support the losers from the early retirement of the coal power plants. Many of the details of the JETP are still in the process of being developed, with the South African government and the international partner groups uh, currently uh, drafting the investment plan as well as the related financing package, which, to be honest, is going, most likely going to be concessional and non-concessional loans. Uh, from what I've heard, the, the, it's going to be released at COP27, but a version has already been leaked as these things happen. Um, and in this plan, it, it says it outlines different rules for pub public and private sector funding. The JFP financing package presents an opportunity for MDBs and DFIs to experiment with novel financial mechanisms, reacting to pressure to take action against climate change. Global policymakers have urged MDBs and DFIs to take greater risk in their clean energy investments in emerging economies. What does this mean, right? Is that DFIs and MDBs need to uh, aim to develop and create investment op opportunities rather than just investing in near market ready opportunities. This requires greater focus on pipeline development, pioneering, demonstrating investments, and early stage investments, which in turn uh, requires greater use of high-risk capital. Ultimately, DFIs, to be part of this 
trans um, to, to, be, to make a significant impact on this transition, they need to change what, where, and how they invest. While the JetB is still in the process of being operationalized in South Africa, its announcement has raised hopes of similarly ambitious deals being struck in other carbon-intensive emerging economies, Vietnam, India, India, and Indonesia, as well as for other aspects of climate action, such as adaptation and resilience. What I want to emphasize is while there may be scope and appetite for these similar deals, it's neither feasible nor recommended for the South African deal to be copied and pasted across countries. These partnerships are country-driven and rely on highly individualized consultations between host nation leaders and partner governments. At the same time, the, the JETP and South Africa's emerging platform highlights some key features and functions that are likely to be desirable across uh, country platforms. Where did I do the slide? Oh, sorry. <laughs> right, so in broad terms, a country platform is a government-led, multi-stakeholder partnership that is used to attract and coordinate international public finance in support of common goals. More simply put, it's a vision of how international cooperation on development and climate change could or should be organized at the country level. There are three common functions that a country platform inspired by the JETP model is expected to perform. First, it needs to coordinate national politics and international interests behind a shared plan or goal. Second, it needs to align international concessional finance behind that shared plan. And third, it needs to develop a genuine step change, sorry, de deliver a genuine step change in climate action. But, you know, that sounds great, right? But what perhaps is more important is how will a platform actually do this? First, it will need a credible, credible political agreement between the host government and international partners to address an issue of shared concern. This provides the basis for a national policy response and for the international community to release significant additional resources to accelerate the necessary reforms. The political agreement essentially signals commitment and unlocks financing. Second, it requires a programmatic approach to financing to target a specific problem. This requires having a credible plan, effective coordination structures, and a, meal, a means to pool financing from different donors. It is hoped that by having this in place, it will help to avoid the incoherence and high transaction cost that currently characterizes the most, the, the uh, majority of the climate finance landscape. Third, it would involve strategic support to tackle barriers holding back projects and finance for private sector investments in low carbon and clean energy projects. A country platform for like South Africa's aims to shift parts of the economy onto a less, um, less carbon intensive or more climate resilient trajectory. This requires scaling up private sector investment in clean energy and other climate solutions. NDBs and DFIs are not responsible for changing domestic policies and their investments are likely to have little impact without corresponding energy sector regulatory reform. In South Africa's case, it's very clear that the Sussex, Sussex ah, sorry, the achievement of JETP uh, hinges on domestic reforms that maximizes the effect of public spending and induces the flow of private capital. I would like to, uh, to conclude with one related point, and that's, that is that it's 8.5 billion. Given the size of South Africa's economy, th their revenues, uh, it's a small, a relatively small amount. Um, I think ESCOM itself estimated that it requires 20, 27 billion to kickstart the shift away from coal fire generation in coming years. A South African university estimated that to create a clean energy infrastructure, the government needs 250 billion uh, over the next three decades. The significance of JetP is not its size, but the substance. It's an investment plan and, and accompanied by a, a set of corresponding respond, reforms that South Africa must implement to maximize the package's impact. And ultimately, that it is hoped by doing this that it will create, help to create a pipeline for private sector investment. A recent IMF study noted that for the, South Africa, the greatest obstacle to transforming its energy sector has been insufficient reform rather than a lack of finance. And for me, the JEPI is it, therefore a step in the right direction. It's, it's a new, a new approach, and yes, that involves risk, but the status quo needs to change, and that, that, that's an attempt to do this. Thank you.
Thank yeah. you, Shakira. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so we are soon ready to move to uh, the Q&A also with the uh, audience. But while you are possibly still thinking about your question, so let, let me start by uh, one myself uh, to all, all of you, if you wish to um, express your view. So what I often hear in the context of green finance and uh, the reallocating investor capital from browner to, to greener uh, projects. So uh, the, the question is the quality of information available, something like ratings that could measure the, the, the degree of uh, greenness of, of uh, investments and so on. So what's your view uh, in this regard, and of course, this is something that could vary a lot in different parts of the world. So, how how far are we with this? Uh, uh, what are the challenges? What should be done? Are you happy with the situation or not? Uh, who would like to start, Anthony? Perhaps. Uh? I think there are two aspects in this problem, in a way. One is the financial aspect, and then the second one is the impact aspect. Because, you know, if we are talking about green finance and uh, investment from a green finance perspective, uh, even the financial aspect could have some weaknesses for the banker who is assessing the whole process. And then at the end of the pipeline, you have the interested parties who look at the impact of this process. Uh, is there a way to tackle these information asymmetries and these problems? I think there is a role for regulators in the way the whole situation is being monitored. But there is also a role for you know, peer interaction, because especially when we have banks, global banks, involved in complex transactions, we need to look at green finance in a kind of holistic view. It's just, it just not the product itself, it's a network of transactions that is evolving through this process. So I'm very skeptical about the current criticism about impact investment, if we're measuring correctly and all that, because it, it, it's really about the surface and it's not going below that to the real problems of how you can assess green finance from an impact perspective. So I would say there is a role for the regulators to trigger a more in-depth analysis of green finance. Okay, thanks. Uh, Amir, would you like to, like to add something? Or? My point wouldn't be so much on the... So you mentioned a kind of level of readiness for these type of investments, but I was going to turn more towards the side of uh, readiness in, in different ways, apart besides you know uh, credit ratings and so on, but readiness in terms of local skills, infrastructure and so on, and going to the theme of industrial policy. But I don't know if this is maybe for another question or worth go discussing ahead. now. I mean, go ahead. If you know. um, so the part I'm mostly interested in is the kind of discussion around green industrial policy, right? Besides the, alongside market-based mechanisms, but this is the way to ensure that those kind of transitions are not only about, um, you know, feasibility, but also fairness and politically attractive and in many developing countries, the big challenge is not just deploying renewables, because in many ways, especially in Latin America, right, renewable energy deployment has been a lot more successful than in Europe or North America and, and most other parts of the world, right? But the challenge is how to make sure that this type of investment, that this type of financing is one that actually generates local value and multiplier effects. So in that sense, I think that there is a lot of work to do in terms of you know kind of local readiness in terms of skills preparation because you see green industries re that create green jobs require green skills to be able to capture those jobs mm -hmm. and a lot um, kind of clarity of information sharing and vision right in terms of mm -hmm. how those investments uh, are integrated with the rest of the country so i think a case that comes to mind uh, namibia right which has a very ambitious green hydrogen plan uh, financing that seems to be available for it but the whole question that arises, how is this connected with the rest of the economy and people who actually suffer from energy access mm -hmm. gaps, right? Yeah. No. Thanks. Sure. Shakira. So, I mean, the concept of a just energy transition, it's not something that's fixed or defined, right? So I think 
That's why for South Africa, a key part of this partnership is doing the investment plan, so that people will have an idea of this is what we in South Africa think a just energy transition is, this is what the areas of potential projects uh, will be, and this is what you know, we want to match different financing to. So I think information is very key, that, that signaling of you know, we have a, pi a, a pipeline or we have an idea of a, a pipe, what a pipeline will look like. I mean, some banks and some actors have said, we're not going to finance coal at all, but what about the transition? And that transition financing, uh, it's, it's, it's less uh, sure, right? And I think there's appetite and there's a role for information to shape of what, that, what, what transition looks like and how it should be financed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's great. Thanks. So now, um, questions from the audience, please. Uh, I think there was a... Please, and uh, if you can uh, introduce yourself also briefly, thank you. All right, all right. Uh, thanks uh, so much. My n name is Michael D Danko from UNU Wider. Uh, just a bit of a, f a follow up. I am very much interested in your what you uh, call the views on uh, green f uh, finance and the new growth path for low-income countries. What are your thoughts on that? Because, I mean, there's that fact that uh, uh, that uh, the, the raw material f footprints for, for many of these low-income countries ha have been uh, going up uh, over, the, over, over time. It's, it has its own implications on the, on the carbon, what do you uh, call this, sinks, right? The uh, forest reserves and, you know, on and on. So uh, clearly the need to look into a new uh, growth path, look into new j mm. jobs, be it blue or, or green or whatever. If you have any thoughts on that, that'd be good. Thanks. Thank you. Who would like to start? I would like to offer a couple of comments. First comment, I think predictability is very important. Because when you talk to, to bankers, the first issue they will raise at this point, at this juncture of time, would be predictability. I mean, they would argue that because of geopolitical reasons and all that, all the agenda about green is being redrafted. So, you know, we need to introduce some predictability in order to have decent financial decisions. This is the first thing. When it comes to specifically uh, developing countries and least developed countries, I would argue for the low level energy efficiency and green finance solutions. Because this is something that the international community keeps ignoring. I think it's, you know, if you look at it from the appropriate technology point of view, it makes a lot of sense. And we need to emphasize more and allocate more resources and capacity on that. Let me add one other point, which is related also to the previous question. When it comes to policies for green transition, I think capacity to upstream investment projects is very important at the country level, especially for least developed countries. And this is something that we need to you know, put up front in a way. Thanks. So, yeah, to answer your question, maybe two more specific things uh, in terms of new green financing mechanisms. So I mentioned earlier the role of national development banks, right? And nowadays you see a switch in some countries where national developing banks in developing countries take a proactive role in providing kind of green financing needed to scale up right, uh, green projects and, and localize industrial benefits. So Brazil has an interesting case, right, with BNDS who played a key role in actually can take a lot of the credit for the successful uh, emerging wind turbine manufacturing sector, right, where they were providing competitive uh, credit, uh, or competitive rates, below market rates for, um, for bids that had higher local content around you know, uh, wind energy projects. And the other side is, um, you mentioned kind of blue green economy, one, uh, some uh, work that I do is on biodiversity-based innovation. So obviously, as part of a green transition, 
uh, it also im implies that a lot of the world's remaining biodiversity, which is in the developing world, would need to be protected. Right? And to date, this is something from the whole world benefits from, right? clean air, carbon capture services, uh, watershed services, but no one really pays for it. Uh, and in that context, there are new uh, financing mechanisms that have emerged, including payments for ecological services, right, where governments pay landowners who adopt uh, sustainable forestry management techniques, but the problem is they still remain at the government level. Right? It's not the international community that often pays for these services, sometimes. But. And the other side is that biodiversity has a lot of value, ecological value, but also as value as a source of innovation and information, for, uh, as a source of information and inspiration for innovation. And very often that value is being captured in a handful of countries, right? in North America, Europe, uh, East Asia, and not necessarily locally. So if we kind of rethink about the different ways to, to, to localize some of the value of those green assets through blue or green economy measures, it's a different way to generate uh, funding and financing for, for the green transition. Thanks. Shakira, would you like to? Fine. You're fine. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Kunal had a question there, please. So I had a question, so I'm Kunal Sindh, uh, I had a question for Amir, and a question for Shakira, that's a lot, from a lot of two questions. Uh, but Amir, the question about industrial policy, green industrial policy. So if you look at the past, the history of industrial policy, hmm. uh, it's a very mixed record. So East Asia did pretty well with industrial policy, but Latin America, Africa, South Asia did very, pretty poorly. There, yeah. there may be exceptions. So, but the, and therefore, my question is that given the green industrial policy needs more information requirements of selecting winners, exactly as you heard from Hugo in the morning, how can we show that green industrial policy can avoid the mistakes that happen in past industrial policy? Mm -hmm. That you pick winners without knowing exactly the question of where they're investing, how do we check what they're investing, and so on, uh, which is, was always a problem with the past industrial policy, will more, be more of a problem with green industrial policy. Mm. And so do we really want to get to a situation where with green industrial policy, we see the same problems of cronyism and, and, and state capture and so on, which we have seen many examples of that in, in, in the past. Uh, so my question is, can green industrial policy really work? Uh, Shakira, my question is back to what you said of South Africa, and it really poses very interesting challenges that I was facing, that they're shutting down coal uh, plants um, and they think about renewable energy. But then the question I have is that, what about those workers in those coal-fired plants who are in one part of South Africa who are going to lose their jobs in the in near future, who are of a particular demographic group, they're fairly old, they are skilled in particular industry, in an industry which will not be, they cannot transfer their skills to some other industry. What can we think about in this just energy uh, just transition for those who are going to be losing out? How do we compensate them? Uh, and how can we make sure that this doesn't become a political cost for countries going through this kind of transition? So my question is that I think what are the political implications of just energy, energy transition we need to think about in, in the future? Thank you. Uh, so we start with Shakira on two questions potentially. Sure. Uh, um, it, not to steal your, your question, but like I, I've, I've been looking at green industrial policy as well. And to me, the problem with past countries and, and industrialization is that what they ha the challenge is also when you realize you have a loser, how do you stop supporting the loser? So how do you create those systems and checks and balances and, to, and retain that autonomy of you're working closely with the private sector, but that doesn't stop you from withdrawing support when it doesn't work. But I'm sure Amir will get into that in more detail. Um, the workers in South Africa, I mean, yes, the concept of the just energy transition is just, right? But the investment plan, I'm, I haven't seen it as yet. I, I'm looking forward to see, it, to see what exactly what this social justice component is, because that's the idea, right? That there are winners and losers. And how do you, put, how do you compensate these losers so that it reduces vested in interest and this could actually have a chance of progressing? And you, some people might be able to be retrained uh, some people might be compensated through social protection mechanisms, uh, who's go but some people will fall through the cracks. And it's a very important question, and I haven't seen the proposal as yet, and something I'm really looking forward to seeing, hopefully, a COP. Uh, I will say, like, the, the world is looking on, right? Because like, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, we, they want to know, okay, how did you actually do this? And most importantly, 
did the international community provide you with grants to help you cover these things that the private sector won't do, that you can't borrow for, because that's not going to re generate returns to repay those loans. So it's, I think it's a big unknown right now, but it's a key part of the, of the partnership, and uh, we, need to, we, we, we expect to see more about me writing more about it very soon. Okay. Uh, thanks, Canal. This is a very important uh, question. So in many ways, we are witnessing a green revival of industrial policy, right, nowadays, arising from the increasing acknowledgement that those policy tools are needed to, to address uh, climate change, because the kind of changing conception requires also a changing of productive structures. Uh, and even in the US, now the term industrial policy is being acknowledged for the first time in decades, but it's only in the context of climate change, right? It's, uh, it's about solar cells and so on. And green industrial policy, in many ways, you know, it's industrial policy, you know, in the context of low carbon sectors, including similar tools, but not always. But you're right that some of the old issues of industrial policy, it would be a lie to say that they don't exist anymore. And I think we see that in the practice of it. Uh, many countries, uh, especially in the African context, when they've adopted green industrial policies, it tends to be limited to local content requirements for solar panels. And in many ways, that's probably one of the worst types of in green industrial policy that, could, yeah, that you could do. Because, I mean, it's very difficult to export solar panels. It's a very competitive market. And the technology is also changing so fast that you become at risk of te technological op uh, op obsolescence. And there's been research showing that from about 30 countries that have impl implemented local content requirements in solar cells, only two have managed to export them, right? China and Spain, and these are countries that leverage pre-existing capabilities in different sectors, especially electronics, towards solar cells. Uh, and the other issue is that you know, not all green industrial policies are necessarily green, right? because we think about the carbon footprint, but then there's the whole problem of material footprint. It's not just about producing more things. However, despite those limitations, um, it's important to not throw the baby with the bath water, right? And there are many ways in which green industrial policy is not only necessary to move forward with low carbon production and, 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 and innovation. But in many ways, it's about sharing benefits more equally, right? Ensuring that countries that are resource dependent, who cannot export the same products that they're exporting now in 20, 30 years because of consumer demand or because of climate agendas, that they have something else to, to, to produce and, and, and other sources of foreign exchange. And the other thing to remember is that the risks still exist, right, in terms of there are ways to mitigate them. And I think some things we can learn from history in terms of performance requirement, learning how to fail, right, and from, from previous mistakes and adapting and monitoring and evaluation. But still, it's true that there are always risks. But it's important to remember that the costs of not doing it are, are higher than the risks of industrial policy, because you see that for resource dependent countries, you know, the future with the status quo is very clear, right, and it's extremely bleak. Thank you. Anthony, would you like to add something? You're fine. Thank you. I think we had a question, uh, at least there in the middle. So please. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yes. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> Uh, th thank you so much for, uh, for three great uh, presentations. The politics are much more important than this, right? We just need to think about you know, Europe, the farmers in the Netherlands, the truckers. I'm a cyclist in North America, the truckers in Canada, as like they've, you know, they've traumatized us, right? And this is, this, the, the truckers started with you know, the concerns about the, 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 the oil industry in Western Canada, right? So the politics are absolutely important. The reason I'm saying is the research that we produce, is, it's really important to take account of that, right? Because we're fighting misinformation, effectively. You're fighting those politics, so it's, so it's really important. I actually had a very specific question. It's completely different to, to Anthony. I was very glad that you raised the issue of, it's a great presentation, the issue of technology, then the finance of technology. And you, uh, you mentioned patents, and I was just wondering if you have any idea uh, whether the, the intellectual property regime that we currently have, if we think back to the, you know, the worst disaster that we've seen around the vaccines, uh, how, how that was, was monopolized, almost monopolized, uh, and did not, did not, was publicly funded, but not, did not become a public good. Whether you think that that plays any role in, in, in the needed green technologies and whether this is a topic of, of research, I'm looking at, at, at Kunal, right? A topic of research that perhaps we should integrate into those discussions. Thank you. 
I have a longer slide deck with some slides on patents and all that, and I'm happy to share. Uh, from that set of slides, what emerges is that when it comes to green innovation, we have seen a plateau since you know, uh, 2010. And the people who try to explain this, this trend in a way, they say it's primarily because of uh, uh, market trends. Because they see that green innovation is going down, but it has stabilized and increases slightly when it comes to end user. And there the example they give is the uh, electrical car. Yeah? Because, you know, a market was there, it was booming, and um, innovation was pulled in in a way. So that would be my, you know, my answer to, to, to your question. And I'm happy to share the, the slides who, you know, demonstrate that. Would you have any views to add here? Um. You're fine, thank you. Please. Hello, Sarah again, and with two questions again, I'm afraid. Um, so the first one is uh, to Amira and Shakira. It was really great to hear you speaking about the jobs because the political economy of this is so, is so key. Um, it, it actually reminded me of the story in the late 2000s where China sent a delegation over to Germany to ask advice on managing the transition out of coal. And they found that Ch Germany only had 20,000 workers in coal and the delegation went home because they have <laughs> 5.3 million people to get out of coal jobs, which is coincidentally the population of Finland. Um, so the, the first question to, uh, to builds on what Kunal was asking about green industrial policy to Amir and Shakira, which is to say, what do you, even if you got green industrial policy right, uh, what are the real prospects for low and lower middle income countries to get onto those supply chains now, mm. given that the US and the EU are setting up these protectionist arrangements with the Inflation Reduction Act and the Green Deal, that China dominates markets and India is trying to do the same domestically? Is there a real chance for a Mozambique or, or an Indonesia to be a part of that story? Um, and the second question is to Anthony. Uh, it was really great to hear you speak about a wider range of finance instruments for climate change, you know, ESCOs for energy efficiency and so on. Um, and I, I wanted to explore an idea that hasn't been mentioned today, uh, which is that the conversation about debt for climate seems to be about debt for real world emission reductions or increases in solar and so on. I wonder if there's a, is there a scenario that you can see where debt or other instruments that you mentioned can be linked to changes in spending. So debt in return for fossil fuel subsidy reform, uh, increases in carbon pricing, are, are those mechanisms used elsewhere? Could they be transferred to the climate space? Thank you very much. Thank you. So maybe we start with Anthony, please. Yeah, my, my short answer is yes, because uh, that's why I argue that we need to understand better the mechanics of how these policies and initiatives are being implemented. And then we can build, say, uh, the data sets that are related to efficiency in these processes. And then you can link them to, to, to transactions in a way. Because take, for example, energy, energy efficiency, the thing you discussed before. Uh, if you go to real life, we have interesting policies being implemented at the bank level. They have data monitoring how effective these policies are. So you can link this, this performance in a way to whatever instrument you want to structure. So my idea is that when you start from below the rather low profile uh, green finance potential applications, there you have already platforms that have been implemented. You have data demonstrating to what extent something works or not. And then you can link it to you know, uh, transactions in the market in a way. And that's, this is the way to leverage real life facts with, you know, forward looking markets in a way. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your question, Sarah. Um, so basically in the context of low uh, and low and low middle income countries and how to address the question of jobs and, and green industrial policy, there's still you're right that policy space is constrained in many ways. Um, however, there are still like new, different types of opportunities for these countries, but you know, with, with caveats. I think one of the big issues that I think you're hinting on is uh, the fact that 
something that is happening with it's happening different sectors, but in low carbon sectors in particular, the rate of innovation is very fast and there is so much uncertainty regarding which technologies are actually going to scale up and which ones might not. Uh, and in that context, it's very difficult for developing countries to localize some of the supply chains, right? Even though there are attempts, but even when it comes to lithium ion batteries, there's so much resources being put into batteries that use different supply chains that are not with lithium, but hydrogen based batteries or phosphate based and same with solar panels and, and, and many other technologies. So I think that my opinion is that when it comes to those kind of uh, industries, developing countries, especially those with lower capacity or those where you know, each, there is a high opportunity cost of those investments, they might be better or safer investments downstream as opposed to upstream because you don't want to localize you know, the supply of goods and services for particular technologies and then the technology changes in 10 years, and same with hydrogen, right? Electrolyzing technology is changing, you know, uh, very fast. But when it comes to once you have, let's say, a, a, a source of cheap, uh, clean and re reliable energy, it opens up many different areas, some of which we know about, but some of those we don't even know yet what will be the next opportunities. That includes technology services, right? That are technology intensive. Uh, and that can be localized if you already provide this kind of uh, energy and where energy is the most impensive, expensive input. Uh, but also things like green steel, green uh, aluminium. And then the second point related for countries like Mozambique, you said, is the whole thing about transportation. That links to your point about information and, and data sharing. So far in investment decisions, the emissions from transportation are not always fully understood or taken into account. But in many ways, does it make sense to you know, ship let's say, hydrogen from Southern Africa so that it can be turned into green steel in Japan and then sold back you know, in, in Saudi Arabia, right? That, that, has a lot, that has a cost, not only commercial, but also environmental, right? The environmental cost of shipping. So if you take that into account, sometimes does it make sense to localize some of those industries or shorten some of that supply chains? And same with things like wind turbines, where it's so massive that you know, transporting has a huge environmental cost. Uh, and it's happening particularly in Latin America, where all of the raw materials and goods and the demand is in Latin America, but they're all shipped to China and re-imported as wind turbines. So this is the, and obviously a regional supply chain is not easy to build, but from an ecological, but also development point of view is probably what makes a lot more sense. Um, yeah. um, so just building a bit on what Amir said, as I said in the presentation, like the the state of the electricity sector in South Africa is a huge obstacle to growth. So just helping to make that better will help create jobs. And it might be in, uh, some of it will be in renewable energy, but it will be also outside the energy sector. Uh, and bear in mind, it's, it's uh, unemployment rate of 32%. Uh, coal mine workers, I think it's, it's about 120,000 workers in South Africa, in the coal mine, as well as in the aging power plants the potential for job creation from the transition is significant. And some people may say that itself is just, is just that you do creating these jobs will create more opportunities compared to the people who, who will lose out. Of course, the people who lose out will feel differently. Um, the good thing about the South Africa model, I would say it's very consultative. Uh, it's, it didn't start at COP26. It, it, uh, since 2015, this idea of a just energy transition has entered their rhetoric and the development agenda. Um, I will say, too, that it's the forward planning and thinking, okay, these are the industries we want to create. How do we get the younger generation having th those skills? And the idea is that that is what South Africa is trying to do. Uh, a lot of countries have tried it in the past, uh, building those skills, but it, it hasn't um, materialized in the way that it, it was planned. But, you know, the idea is that how having a clear agenda and a plan to, and a set of reforms to back that up it increases the probability of these things actually leading to a positive outcome. And I think there is reason to be hopeful. Um, uh, right now, they think in South Africa's case, they're talking about the manufacturing of electric vehicles um, and green hydrogen, which I know less of, but I think that there is real potential for job creation. Yes. Thank you. So we still have uh, some time left. Uh, uh, I have two questions, and I, I think that that'll be it. So please uh, go ahead first uh, back there, and then. 
And thank you. My name is Maureen. I come from Kenya. Uh, my question is to Shakira. I'm just curious to know uh, to what extent uh, this uh, partnership, if there's any possibility of it being extended to other countries and the practicability of it. Plus, uh, we know that South Africa, I think the, the focus is more on the production of coal. But how about these other climatic challenges? Is there any possibility that this could be extended to cover that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hold on for a second sure. so we can c combine with the other uh, last question? Now. So, Tony, please. I'm Tony Addison, Copenhagen and wider. So my, my question is um, linking up the, the green agenda with, with the debt question, which is, um, you know, say I'm a minister of finance and I, I say basically, well, I really like your, you know, ideas around industrial policy and the just transition and job creation. But, but these are really, at most, medium-term, long-term gains to the economy. And, you know, next month I have to find a billion dollars to repay my, my debt, service my external dollar-denominated debt. And at the moment, all I have got is um, uh, fossil fuel um, earnings, coal in the case of South Africa, or oil in the case of Venezuela, um, there are some powerful incumbents in the sector. The National Oil Company is saying, well, you know, we're very viable. There's a very good market for oil and gas. There's still a very good global market for coal. You know, we, we can sell this stuff. So my, my short-term problem is I need to service the debt. Um, can you help me out on this? You know, what's your response? Thank you. So we'll start with uh, Shakira and sure. then everybody can... Uh Sure. So the idea of the partnership, like South Africa being extended to other countries, that's definitely the current intention, uh, targeting uh, other high carbon emitters in emerging economies like India and Indonesia. But uh, in our paper at ODI, we, we make the case that it's climate action, it's not only mitigation. So there is a potential of, trans of using this model, the political agreement, having concessional uh, finance backing a shared plan and vision to, to deliver something that's a, a, a definite um, change as opposed to a marginal improvement. So th there is that potential, we think, for adaptation and resilience. How that would look, it it's, hasn't been done yet. There, there's a lot of appetite and a, a room to help um, for, uh, develop a framework of what this may look like. So I, I think, yes, it, it, it is a possibility and uh, it's something that uh, we, we at ODI plan to do more work in as well. Uh, it, I, I will say it, it, it's related to the fact that climate finance, the project pr uh, financing approach, it hasn't produced the results that we want. It's, it's messy, it's costly, you can't easily access the finance. So really finding a new approach to work with countries to support their priorities. That, that's the goal of this uh, platform approach. Um, in terms of uh, Tony's point, which is yes, Short, uh, in terms of the short term uh, treat of uh, when you when you I, I worked in the government and I advise governments and you know you want to pay salaries you need to service your debt and a lot of these things are very medium to long term so really in the case of South Africa it, that's why it really has to start with that political agreement in terms of um, that buy-in from the top if that's not there domestically, it's not going to happen because there's too many interests against it and those interests are well organized, right? Uh, in the sense of South Africa, ESCOM debt is such a huge problem and it, it, it can't go on, right? And they recognize that's having an adverse effect on their own public finances and on economic growth. So that's why it's a win-win situation there. In other countries where you may not have that incentive, uh, that's the political dynamics are different, and really, what will the international community offer to sweeten the deal? And that, that's, that's, that's still to be decided, right? I know in, um, in Ecuador, a long time ago, they had that deal like, you, you, you leave the oil on the ground and we'll pay you X amount of money. That never happened for a variety of reasons. Because, you know, it's, it's how, how, do international, how does international public finance using that to pay off your debts is not gonna fly? But how, how do you improve the 
the, la the international architectures of the countries could uh, restructure their debt in a more timely and efficient way and where this, uh, as uh, uh, Ugo was saying, like linking those things to climate. And I think that's the way we need to go. It's, it's, it's going to be messy, it's going to be tricky, but that's definitely what we have to do going forward. I'll stop there. Thank you. We're actually pretty much done with our uh, time, but would either of you like to add uh, to... Yeah, uh, I, to I wanted to, to, to extend a bit your question to another aspect. One is debt service, the other is fresh capital. Your minister is interested about fresh capital and goes to London or New York trying to, uh, you know, persuade people in the banking sector to get interested in his country. Uh, the first response he will get will be a cynical one. When he starts talking about green strategy, etc., the banker will interrupt him and say, you know, this is just noise, I'm interested in your returns. And then you have the more sophisticated type of bankers. They will raise two issues. One is risk, the second is aggregation. So I think from an academic point of view, the challenge we have, and I'm trying to be a bit provocative here, the challenge we have is to see how we can integrate risk and aggregation in a kind of bottom-up policy from the endogenous needs of a developing country. Because even sophisticated bankers, this is what they are looking for. And if indeed fresh capital is in need, we need to try to accommodate uh, these responses in a way. Uh, Tony always asks the, the tough questions. Uh, but in that context, uh, the, the, the point I could add is the idea of thinking about those pathways between short-term needs and long-term objectives. Right? There's no one way to a low-carbon future. And, uh, and obviously, sometimes there are tensions, but there are also ways that short-term objectives can be leveraged even when thinking about you know, fossil fuels, right? There are different ways in which, you know, you ask the question, is, does that short-term extraction help long-term productive capabilities, let's say in blue hydrogen, and then transition towards green hydrogen? And that also addresses the point of, of skills and jobs, right? And in many ways, the people are working in coal or fossil fuels, not all skills can be repurposed. Some of them can be, if you work in temperature engineering, you can work in renewables. If you work in drilling, it's going to be di very difficult. But then it's kind of thinking about which parts of the short-term objectives are, can be repurposed, which parts are gone. And the case of Nauru, which, we, which you know, I've often uses, is a cautionary tale in that regard, because short-term extraction of phosphate meant that long-term renewable income of agriculture was destroyed forever. Right? And this was a context in which the short-term plan just meant that in the long-term the country was going bankrupt. And now its uh, you know, main source of income is being a refugee detention center for Australia. So this is the opposite way, but I guess these are the questions in terms of short-term planning to keep the future windows open as opposed to closing them down. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's lunch time. Thank you all for your questions and please join me to thank the uh, excellent speakers. <laughs> <laughs>